Season 1, Episode 6 of Queer as Folk, The Art of Desperation. This one was directed by Carrie Scoglund, who also directed the last episode, and it was written by Jonathan Tollins. It first aired in the U.S. on January 21st, 2001, and in Canada on February 12th, 2001. We open on Captain Astro, we're in a comic book store, but more importantly, the narration is back. In the last episode, I said that every time I get to episode 5 and there's no narration, I think, okay, we're done with the narration, it's done now. And then episode 6 comes along and it's back. So we have Michael giving us a voiceover narration for the beginning of the episode. So I'm a gay man with a superhero fetish. Yes, we're out there. And no, it doesn't have anything to do with immaturity. Maybe a bit though, Michael. It's always good to be part of a dynamic duo. So obviously Michael thinks that him and Brian are a dynamic duo, and they kind of are. I'm not sure how I feel about the narrating being back. I I don't mind it, I guess. I don't know, I'm not a huge fan. Like I said, it was fine in the first three episodes, and then after that it's kind of felt unnecessary. It's just always weird that it disappears in episode five, but then it's back in episode six. It always kind of feels like to me that Brian was taking over too much of the narrative or too much control of the story, and so they gave it back to Michael in episode six in this voice over and reaching is probably just because they forgot about it or they didn't feel like they needed it in episode five. Michael says that he blew it. Don't worry, there's still plenty of creepy old men out there who'd love to get in your pants. First doctor. A chiropractor. That counts, I think. A doctor? A chiropractor. So the comic book store worker is grabbing Brian's attention. And why? I mean, uh, no offense to this guy, but the first time I saw this, I remember being like, wait, really? Like he's genuinely interested in him. I mean, he looks fine. It's just like he's really into this guy that works at this comic book store. I don't know. Brian's tastes, as we see, aren't very discriminatory. Picky. Takes me to this really nice restaurant. I behave like a fucking idiot. It wasn't me. You know why? Because I'm nobody. That's my problem. No, you are somebody, Michael. You've just been so caught up with and obsessed with Brian that you almost sometimes just kind of seem to live his life. Are you even listening to me? I tune out self-pity, it makes my dick soft. Brian is really committed to his gum. That's what I always think during this scene, like he's really committed to that gum. Michael buys an action figure for Gus. He says it's gonna be collectible someday. Um, Brian says that he's gonna take it over there. And I think that Michael probably wanted to give it to Gus though, or Melanie and Lindsay. And Brian's like, oh, I'll take that over there for you. Yeah, but it's a gift, Brian. It's not, like they're not borrowing a lamp or something. Not that anyone would ever borrow a lamp, but... So then Brian tells Michael that he should go back to the doctor and give it another chance. And then Justin and Daphne are out on Liberty Avenue and they're looking at some jewelry on the sidewalk. And we learn that apparently Justin's mom is cool with everything or is at least pretending to be so that Justin doesn't run away. I mean, I don't think she's pretending, but I think that Justin running away is probably a very real fear that she has because he did sort of run away in the last episode. It didn't last very long. It didn't even last overnight, but it happens. Wait, it did last overnight. He didn't come home. He went to Brian's for one night. Oh, that's true. Okay, it did last one night. My mom's such a bitch and I haven't even given her a reason yet. So then Justin picks out some friendship bracelets for the two of them and convinces Daphne that they would be cool. Then she finally says okay and then she thanks Justin, but then Justin lets her know that he doesn't have any money on him because apparently he had to buy a new fake ID. I always wonder why, like why did he have to get a new one? What was wrong with the old one? I don't know. Daphne has to pay. Ugh, this boy, I, I just... And then we've got this iconic line from Justin. Look, that's them. Brian's lesbians. So Justin spots Melanie, Lindsay, and baby Gus, or should I say, baby doll Gus. Also, gotta love that Canadian flag in the background of this shot. It's so crazy to me how we're on the sixth episode of the show and Lindsay's like, I'm sorry, do we know you? It's really, it's crazy to think that they really only met for a couple of minutes the night that Gus was born and that was it. I guess that Brian probably wouldn't have mentioned him since and we know that Michael wouldn't, but it's just weird that Justin has spent time with all the other characters, but not Lindsay and Melanie. He was there for the birth. No, he wasn't there for the birth. They always say that he was there for the afterbirth. <laughs> He seems a little hurt that they don't remember him. So when Gus ends up pumping gas, we'll have you to thank. <laughs> I just love Lindsay's strained laughter here. I mean, it doesn't really sound very strained, but I always imagine it to. Because let's not forget, she's the one who actually picked out the name Gus. Like, Gus was her idea. And the show, it gets said a lot that Justin named Gus or picked his name or something like that. And really, it was Lindsay who picked it. And then I guess Justin kind of just decided between that and Abraham. You've been thinking of names. Mel wants to call him Abraham after her grandfather, mm -hmm. but I like Gus. What do you think? But I guess Gus is okay. I didn't really name him. I mean, I think that kid was going to be called Gus no matter what. I mean, that's the name that Lindsay wanted. I think she was going to get it. Anyways, it seems a little mean and passive-aggressive for Melanie to say that in front of Lindsay, 
when she knows that it was actually her who came up with the name Gus. But, you know, again, this is yet another thing that Melanie has compromised on with the baby. And then we've got maybe my favorite line ever from Daphne here. I'm not lesbian, but I, I, I'm a big fan. Oh, and oh look, it's a real baby now. We've actually got real baby Gus now. Baby doll Gus has left. So Justin offers to be a babysitter and also to help them take their stuff to the car. And then Daphne's just like, I'll see you later. And then Justin says, I don't know. I'll see you later. I don't know. Wow, Justin, Daphne just kind of puts her arms up like, what? First, Justin makes her pay for those two bracelets that he wanted that she didn't even want in the first place. And then he just ditches her on Liberty Avenue all by herself. Like, they came there together. And then he's just like, yeah, bye, see you sometime later, I guess. I don't know. And then she's just there by herself. Out, who knows how much, after buying those bracelets. Oh, Justin. But he's like, oh, here's my inn. I got an inn here with these guys, so I gotta take it while I can. Okay, so I guess the main question after this scene is what was Justin trying to accomplish here? I think that he was happy to see these two or three from Brian's life and he saw them the first night of everything that happened. So maybe he thinks that he'll be able to worm his way into Brian's life a little bit more. The last time he saw Brian was when Justin was shirtless at Woody's. And while that interaction went okay, it didn't go fantastically. Like he's obviously not uh, like a main part in Brian's life yet. Also maybe does just like babies too. Maybe he likes hanging out with babies and babysitting. And of course, let's not forget that it would be Brian's son that he's babysitting, which I'm sure he'd be real thrilled about. Justin, not Brian. So then we see Ted and Emmett who are clothes shopping. No more bars, no more baths, no more clubs. You'll never see my face at Babylon again. Even though at the end of the last episode, uh, we did see him at Babylon after he said he wasn't gonna go back there. He's saying, you're never gonna see my face at Babylon again. And I'm like, I feel like we've heard that before, Ted. Woody's in Babylon are no longer deductible expenses. He'll be back. I knew you couldn't stay away. And then Ted finds an ad for date bait. Meet other civilized men for a night of conversation at the center. No face-to-face -face rejection, which I'm sure Ted would love. And they're having an over 30 night. Where, the morgue? And just for that, you're going with me. I am not over 30. Michael has showed up at Dr. David's office. And I'm sorry I was such an asshole. You weren't an asshole. Believe me, I've seen assholes and... Michael tries to get another chance with Dr. David. You're adorable, you know that. So when Michael finally acts like himself around David, things go well, unsurprisingly, because that seems to be what David likes and what he's after. Brian shows up with the action figure for Gus at Melanie and Lindsay's house, and the way he puts it in the door, it's kind of like a peace offering. And then Melanie says, oh, that's so sweet, I'll be sure to thank Michael. Because obviously this isn't the kind of thing that Brian would buy for Gus. I feel like Lindsay just gives him a list and she's like, hey, you can get anything off of here for, for Gus if you if you if you ever think about getting him something, here's a list. I feel like she would do that. Also, at the end of the last episode, Brian decided to be a more involved-ish father, or at least to always be there for Gus and not leave him wanting him to be there like we saw Marvin Telson do. And he seems to be following through on that. You know, he's showing up at Ellen Lynn's during the day to see his son. Some good progress. Then he sees that Justin is there and Justin is sketching Lindsay holding Gus. What's he doing here? We ran into each other on the street. It was like this weird um, coincidence. I bet. And then Brian hits Justin on the back of the head. I love that he's playing around with him and so comfortable with him already. Melanie takes Gus to go change him, but I feel like also partly so that Brian can't hold him at that moment. Lindsay tells Justin that his drawings are really good, and apparently she's an art teacher. Just the word art teacher, I would assume that it's at a high school or something, but I think we find out that it's actually at a university. But honestly, I feel like they go back and forth on this in the show, or maybe that's just my perception of it. I don't know. And then Brian throws a teddy bear at Justin. I love that joking around, it's so great. But what I love even more is in a little bit when Justin throws a teddy bear back at him. I also feel like the power dynamics are kind of shifting here. Like obviously they're still way leading in the same way. They're kind of approaching to be a little bit more on the same level. Oh, don't show him. Oh. So Lindsay shows Brian the sketch that Justin drew of him. It's a sketch of Brian sleeping in bed, semi-nude. When did you draw that? When you were asleep. So I feel like this must have had to have been drawn in between episode 103 and 104. It really makes the most sense for when it was drawn. And I love here how Melanie says, Circumcised. Just like I thought. So see, after all of that about, you know, not wanting Gus to be circumcised, 
Although Melanie really doesn't seem too upset about it when she was very much so a few episodes ago. I guess she's chilled about it. She did get that sweet life insurance policy after all. We learn that there's an art show at the GLC, which is the Gay and Lesbian Center. It might be good to get out and meet some nice young men for a change. I love the emphasis on young. She asks if Justin would like his work to be in the show and Justin says yes. Give him some activity so he'll stop stalking me. Don't flatter yourself. <laughs> We can also see that Justin's got some more confidence now. I guess he's kind of branched out a bit, gave him some more confidence, and he's kind of showing Brian that he's not all about him anymore. But, I mean, he is still all about him, <laughs> mostly. I mean, he is in his child's house right now that he just invited himself to. But what I really love is how Brian looks a little bit hurt here. Maybe his feelings a little bit, but definitely his ego. <laughs> we like Justin. <laughs> Justin can stay. I like Justin too. We'll make sure everyone comes, including you. But it's interesting that he's even mad that she said that. Because if I'm Justin and I hear Lindsay say that, I'm still in no way expecting Brian to show up. You know, I'm hoping that he is, but I'm not expecting. And we kind of see that later on in the episode. I don't think he's expecting Brian to come, but he very, 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 very much wants him to come. So it's just interesting that Brian's even mad about that because it's not like he has to go. So Ted is at the speed dating thing or dating circle date bait. Everyone is wearing a number and everybody just stands up and introduces themselves one at a time. You write your number if you're interested and the numbers match, etc. So basically like speed dating except with less one-on-one -on -one interaction. No one-on-one -on -one interaction actually. And then we have quite the characters at this thing, but one is a guy who teaches piano and voice at Carnegie Mellon. I also conduct the local gay men's chorus. I hope you'll all come. Emmett is wearing a tight shirt that says boys, boys, boys. The whole stomach area is this like sheer thing, which is the shirt that he got when him and Ted were shopping. But I love Emmett's whole attitude at this thing. He's like, I am not that desperate. I'm not gonna dress like those people. My friend made me come. My boyfriend would kill me if he knew. He's doing everything he can to scream, I am not available. And I do not want a serious relationship. I think, how old is he supposed to be? 27? Doesn't seem 27. It seems more like he's 30, but whatevs. And then Ted's introduction is just way too much of an overshare. He says he met a cute guy at Babylon and he took some drugs. I wanted to seem young and sexy, so I took some and I ended up in a coma. <clears throat> and uh, now I'm looking for a relationship based on something real. As opposed to GHB, I guess. Well, and I thought maybe there might be someone here who's looking for the same thing. Way too much information, Ted. Like way, like way too much. Just way too much. It's not get up and share your darkest secret shame thing. It's, hi, I'm Ted. I'm 34. I'm an accountant. I like opera. I think that would have sufficed. I get that he wanted to be upfront and honest about it, but I feel like that's something that you more ease into. If at all, I don't know, is that information pertinent? I feel like he only needed that last part, prefaced with what I said and then that last part at the end. No one needs to know what made you hit dating rock bottom and decide that you needed to come there. I'm sure everyone is there because they've got their own sad, tragic stories. Also, I love how on the back of Emmett's shirt it says, I'm looking for a good time. I can honestly say I have no desire to have sex with any of these people. Me neither. <sighs> to start. I don't know if that's what you're aiming for, but I guess from Ted's point of view, everyone that he's ever been interested in has either not been interested in him, like Michael and many other people that we've seen, or give him drugs which make him end up in a 24-hour coma. So I guess he's trying something new. He's like, well, what I like clearly isn't working for me, so I'm just gonna try the opposite of that and go for something that I do not like at all. So I guess he's trying to go after people who are more like him. Well, maybe you should try going after, you know, someone well, like, like you. And he's gonna see if he has better luck because overall he just really can't trust his own judgment right now. David is at Michael's apartment and says that he's never seen so many comics. Who's a big fella? Captain Astro. Which I'm pretty sure is the first time we hear his name. We hear the name Captain Astro. Could be wrong. We've definitely seen Captain Astro before. I just don't know if we've heard his name out loud. And then David says this. May come home at any time, so sorry about that. You don't have to apologize for everything. And, you know, that's true, but is it very kind of Dr. David to say that? He lifts his shirt around his wrists and starts going at his chest slash nipples. In the last episode, he was all like, whoa, 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 hey, Michael, you want to blow me on the first date? Are you crazy? How could you think that's where this was headed so early on? And then after their second date, one date later, he does this. And I guess that second date really did make all the difference. 
Maybe he's the old fashioned type, doesn't fuck until the second date. So we see Ted is on a date and both him and his date are checking out the waiter and they start showing pickup lines that they would usually use on the waiter. Do I know you from somewhere? No, it must be in a dream. So when did they start hiring models here? Oh. And um, they are truly horrible pickup lines. Truly, truly horrible. I am. Um, I can see why maybe they haven't had much dating left in the past. I was hoping that I would find someone I could connect to. Someone appropriate. Exactly. Appropriate. I don't know if someone appropriate is what you should be aiming for. Like if you're just looking for someone appropriate and then just dating them based on their appropriateness. I guess it's fine if you also happen to like them too. But if you're only dating them because they seem appropriate, it just seems like a bad idea and like you're just setting yourself up for disappointment. But again, we know why Ted is doing this because his other tactics weren't working. So we're back at the gym. 27 minutes on my nipples. I clocked it. 16 right. 11 left. So I always wonder, Michael, why were you watching the clock? Like he knows the exact amount of minutes for each nibble. Why were you just staring at the clock? And, and keeping track of time? Yeah, that's probably how long it takes him to get it up. Ooh, I detect some jealousy from Brian, even though he's the one who encouraged him to try for a second chance with Dr. David. And he's the one who encouraged him to go out with him in the first place. So why is he jealous or kind of ish? Maybe he didn't think that Michael would be this enamored with him. But I use air quotes a lot, don't I? Ugh. So maybe Brian thought that it would be nice in theory for Michael to be interested in someone or after someone other than him. He doesn't actually love the reality of it. And maybe is he also jealous that David sounds better than him? I think that's a big part of it. I think his ego is very much in play here, as it always is. Hey, Roger and I... <laughs> Roger? Roger and I have decided to get to know- This always kills me. Brian's reaction to the guy's name being Roger always kills me because that's my dad's name. You know, you do it right away you don't do it at all. And I feel like there's something to be said for that, but I digress. I'm happy for you, Mikey. Fuck, he is. Hmm, what does this mean? Daphne shows up at Justin's house and we have Justin's sister, Molly, making a reappearance. I think this is the first time we've seen her since 102. I just want to say, I think he's really lucky to have such an understanding mom. <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah, it must be hard, because my family, I'm black, my parents are black, we're all black, you know what I mean? And then Daphne gives Justin's mom the flyer for the art show, and Daphne doesn't realize that she didn't know about it. Promise you won't tell him I told you, or he'll stop telling me. And yes, so I think this kind of shows how self-absorbed Justin's been lately. He obviously hasn't been the best friend, getting Daphne in trouble a lot taking her car, stranding her on Liberty Avenue, making her pay for those bracelets. But anyways, so she's worried that Justin's gonna stop telling her things if he can't trust her. And to be fair, she did just take his mom to Woody's in the last episode. But you know, I like how she realizes that this is the case and she doesn't want it to happen. She doesn't want to lose Justin, but I also think that she thinks that Justin should be nicer or a little bit cooler or whatever to his mom, but she's not going to tell him that because she doesn't want to get Justin mad at her. Justin and Daphne are help setting up the art show, then Daphne compliments a lesbian there. You're really good at that. Thanks. I like you guys' bracelet. And then this woman says that she is heading down to the diner for a soda and asks if Daphne wants to come with her. Sure. She thinks you're a lesbian. Well, can't I be one of the cool people too? You're a freak. <laughs> oh, I love her face here. She's so cute. Also, just imagine, by Daphne, what we could have had. Although I like Melissa Etheridge a lot. Maybe go to art school. I've been thinking about that. I love that these two are bonding and they're bonding over their shared art, art stuff. I clearly know a lot about art stuff, so, you know, no big deal. And then he asks her if she thinks Brian's gonna show up. Don't expect too much from him, okay? What's too much? Anything at all. I just wanted to see his picture frame, that's all. I mean, yeah, I do think it would be best not to expect anything from Brian, because then you could never be disappointed. At this point in time, to be clear, I don't think you should expect anything from him in episode 106. But also, I think that Lindsay is definitely underestimating Brian here, but I think that it is wise of her to tell Justin not to expect anything, you know, because you give that kid an inch and he's just... You just couldn't run with it. Yeah, so I like I could say that, oh, she's underestimating Brian because he has proven that he, you know, does show up for people. And But I don't think that she should be telling Justin that, even if she thinks that, because I don't want to get this poor kid's hopes up. Michael and David are heading into Woody's. Apparently David is not a bar slash club scene person. Just the same as I remember it. Even the guys look the same. Which I feel like is true, you know, in places like that, the people in them never seem to change. Like they all, it always looks the same. We also learn that David was with someone for six years and he died. Where's Ted? 
out with the Pillsbury Doughboy. Which I don't think is fair at all. You know, Roger isn't super, super skinny, but he's by no means a Pillsbury Doughboy. Roger's weight gets brought up again at the end of the episode, and I'll mention it again then, but it really just feels like they were looking to cast someone who was a little bit bigger, but then they wanted to cast this person, so they went with him, but then left all the fat jokes in. Whatever, anyways, I'm gonna move faster. Brian shows up, gets in Michael's lap, and puts his arm around him. I've heard a lot about you. I've heard a lot about you too. 16 right, 11 left. It kind of feels like Brian is just marking his territory here. But then also, Brian is on drugs right now. So that explains it a little bit more. And Michael goes to get him some water. Got him well trained. Also though, I guess I'll just mention this now. Brian is very much someone who always needs to be in control. And that includes being in control of himself. So, you know, we rarely ever see him just completely wasted. And the times that we do see him drinking or on drugs when he's not like totally totally wasted which we do see a couple times. I think that he's never as drunk or high as people think that he is because I think that he always likes to regain some of his control over himself and all of that so so there's that little tidbit. But the times that we do see him really wasted are at very emotional points. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah I think that he's never as out of it as he leads people to think that he is and I think that what he says in this scene with David um, later on just goes kind of to prove that. He takes care of me and I take care of him. So, Doc, do you fuck all of your patients? Good one, Brian. Because that's true. Is it not really skeezy to date someone that you met as a patient, like as your patient? I mean, he's a chiropractor, but still. Well, if you're referring to Michael, I released him from my care before we went out together. Did Michael know that David had released him from his care at that point when they went out together or when he asked him out? Brian and David are just kind of exchanging quips and going back and forth. You know, Dave. What a power move. And then Brian calls Michael Mikey to David. Mikey. So he picks up on it. Mikey is probably the name that Brian has called Michael since they were 14, which is kind of keeping Michael at that age and at that mindset by just continually calling him that. I mean, that's not the only reason that Michael is stuck there, but it's one of. He's just making Michael feel like that 14-year-old boy all the time. And they usually end up with you. The lucky ones. Debatable. Oh, you go, Dr. David. So Brian is jealous obviously, because he's never seen Michael into a guy before. That's not him. I think a big part of it though is that he doesn't want to lose Michael. And then another part of it is him just testing David to make sure that he won't just jump ship as soon as someone better comes along. And I have a lot more to say on the whole Brian not wanting to lose Michael, but I'll get into that in a, in a few episodes and that comes up a little bit more. We're at Ted's apartment and so is Roger. He's playing his favorite aria. So I think that this is the first time we learn that Ted is into opera something that is carried throughout the show, um, but I think this is the first time we kind of see that. Unless I'm wrong, feel free to tell me. And Roger knows the aria, so Ted is pretty thrilled about that. So Ted is not quite ready for sex yet, um, but he will be soon. I have a feeling it's gonna be great. Uh, wow, no pressure or anything, Ted. During this exchange between Ted and Roger, it keeps focusing on Roger's watch and Ted's watch. Basically just showing that the clock is ticking on this thing that they have between them, that it's not gonna last for very much longer, and probably that as soon as the sex happens or start to happen, that's probably gonna be it for this thing. And we're back to Michael and David. Your friend Brian tried to hit on me. He did not. I've been around the block. He's always like that. Besides, he was high. I'm just telling you. He wouldn't. He did. Shit. <laughs> they can't have you. You're mine. Honestly, I love this moment when David kisses Michael here. So yeah, like I said before, part of the reason why Brian was hitting on David was to make sure that he wouldn't ditch Michael because he can see that Michael likes David and is starting to care about him. Lindsay and Gus have stopped by the loft. He gets Lindsay and himself some raisin bran by the looks of it. And then Brian pours the milk really messily uh, for the sake of a line. Don't be a shit. I'm trying to clean up some of your mess. Referring to a different mess. And then she's cleaning up a literal mess really messy and it seems kind of weird. Brian just seems like a real neat freak. But anyways, Lindsay uses paper towels to wipe it up. Brian says that he's not going to the art show. I promised him you'd be there. But we know that she didn't promise Justin. She told him to expect him not to come. So her telling Brian that she told Justin that Brian would come is her doing her best 
to get Brian to come. But then just in case not to get Jessen's hopes up, she told him to expect him not to come. So Lindsay doing all this and Lindsay saying, I promised him that you would come to Brian. I don't know, I think kind of shows at least a little bit that Brian doesn't want to hurt Justin's feelings. And we've seen that before in 102. He didn't want to hurt his feelings like that. And as much as he has hurt his feelings since then, I think he's also always trying to not to do that. So I don't know. He's the one that threw himself at me. I've been trying to get rid of him. I mean, you haven't been trying really hard to get rid of him though, have you? Or like at all? Just for tonight. Seven. Leave him alone. He's all right. He's kind of sweet. Sweet? I thought we got rid of him. And then Brian just starts pelting the bowls of cereal with some sugar cubes. Just because I fuck guys does not mean I'm part of some community, and it doesn't mean I have anything in common with someone else who does. So Brian's not a fan of the GLC, and uh, we kind of see that start here. It's something, again, that's carried throughout the series, and we first see it here. He doesn't like a lot of things that the center does, and I, we're gonna see why a little bit later on. But to be fair, Brian does kind of have a community, his group of friends, but there is also some truth to what he says. You don't have to join a group for whatever, just because you're whatever, but you should, and you should be, and you should be able to, if you want to. Just to let people do what they want, I guess. Brian pours a lot of sugar to the coffee pot and then just starts drinking right out of it. Fuck groups. I thought you did. Occasionally, but it's by invitation only. We love a classic Brian line. So anyways, Brian doesn't like groups. And like I said, we'll see why later. Daphne and Justin are at the art show. We learn that it is $100 for each painting and that the money goes to charity. And that sketch that Justin did of Lindsay and Gus is up there already. And then there's the drawing of Brian and some random naked guy from behind. And would you stop watching the door? When we both know it's the right thing to do. Sex is never the right thing to do. Feeding the poor is the right thing to do. Hiring the handicapped is the right thing to do. Donating blood is All right, the right I mean, he's right. It's never the right thing to do. He's just basically saying that it shouldn't be some big life or death decision or some altruistic thing or whatever. He's here. You didn't want to disappoint Justin. Aren't you gonna go over there? Are you crazy? I love it. He's been watching the door the whole time, obsessively, you know, seeing if Brian's gonna come. And then Brian does show up, but Justin's like, no, I'm not gonna be desperate or clingy. I'm gonna be totally cool, and he's gonna come to me. Justin seems to be learning. Brian is wearing a sleeveless shirt, so I think this event is supposed to be like a semi-fancy event, not casual. He's just dressed like he's ready for a night at Babylon. Like, I'll come, but I'm not gonna adhere to their stupid rules. Oh, I love Lindsay's outfit. Brian sees Michael and David and then just kind of runs away. Debbie is holding Gus. Michael doesn't want David to meet his mom yet. Let's go check out the vagina sculptures first, get it over with. Brian comes up behind Justin. The famous artiste. Don't you see my stuff? Love how nonchalant Justin's trying to be. Brian looks at David and then goes over to Michael. Psst. I think the artist has taken some liberties. Well, that's a perfect likeness. Hey, you haven't seen it in a long time. I haven't seen Gone with the Wind in a long time either, but I know it's still three and a half hours. It's kind of funny that Michael probably still remembers exactly what it looks like. Brian and Michael show. Blah, blah, blah. Was it always like that? Michael running after him? It's the greatest love story never told, trust me. What was your name? David. Long after you're gone, he'll still have Michael. But don't worry, Michael can wait forever. Brian will never fuck him. I like this a lot. I love when she finds out who he is or who he's dating. But I also can't imagine that she would ever believe that Brian would show up there with a date. I know he showed up with Justin to Gus's birth, but I feel like that was a different situation, like an exception kind of thing for shock value. And Justin couldn't go home with because of his parents and all that. But in this situation, I don't know why she thinks that Brian would bring a date. Like, a date. It doesn't seem like he would bring a date to anything. I, I love this moment though. I love this interaction between Melanie and, and, and David. I love how you're just sitting there the whole time like, oh god, no, stop talking. And then when she finds out, it's fantastic. So then Brian says that he was testing David and I don't think he was lying. I think he had other reasons for doing that, but I think that also was one of the reasons. But Michael thinks that he's lying. I don't think he was. I don't think Brian was interested in Dr. David at all. Aren't I always looking out for you? I think he really was looking out for him. I mean, I think he is always looking out for him. Michael takes care of Brian, and Brian takes care of Michael. You're just jealous because somebody finally thinks I'm hot or something. You are hot or something. I've been telling you that since you were 14, but you won't believe me. And Michael's probably thinking, or has thought in the past, well, if you think I'm so hot, then why won't you get with me? And then Brian kisses Michael. So I suppose I just keep him company while Michael waits. Oh, oh, oh shit. 
You were with Michael. Yeah. Um. Oh, Jesus, I, um, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean that. I, I mean, well, I, I mean, Brian's the one that's always showing up with some new guy, so I just assumed that, um... I mean, again, does Brian always show up with a guy? I guess she's telling us that he does, but, huh. I've always admired creative people. Mm, pretty creative yourself there, Missy. But Michael, he's got a gift. But when it comes to taking care of people, knowing what you need better even than you do, he's a fucking Picasso. And I, I love Emmett's look here, and then he kisses her on the cheek. He, you know, he's like, oh, she really, really cares about her son, which is probably nice for him, since I'm sure his mother didn't, uh, wasn't super caring of, you know, towards him. He loves that she sees the best in him, and I, you know, I love that moment. I think that Michael is, you know, kind of good at taking care of people, certainly of Brian, but I also feel like Michael could be a little bit more aware. I don't know how else to say that. You can't stay, you have to leave. I won't embarrass you, I promise. The two of them are talking to Melanie and Lindsay. Actually, Justin's the one who named her. But I guess Gus is okay. Really? Well, that was his teddy bear's name. Oh, a teddy bear. Mom. Which is, I guess, why he was drawn to the name Gus. I feel like they like, keep forgetting who came up with Gus in the first place. I like Gus. But, you know, whatever. I'll move past it. I've never met lesbian mothers before. I mean, I, I read about you all, them papers all the time. <laughs> Seems like there's always some judge in Alabama trying to take our kids away. <laughs> That's why I married a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I love Justin's I'm so sorry look. Well, I love it and I also hate it. Your mom's trying, Justin. She, And they know, they know that, you know, you don't have to apologize. She came. That's huge. Yeah, I mean, she'd love to do more if he let her, but I get it, guys. He's a teenager. It's his mom. I understand. Uh, Ted and Roger are turned on with a art, and they decide to leave to go have sex, and I love this exchange so much. I promise to play the piano. You're just volunteering. You're right. Fuck him. Especially the you're just volunteering part. Like, yeah, let, let them play a CD. He does not need to be there. I love Emmett and Brian in the background of this scene. Brian seems to be holding some sort of art piece or something, and they're laughing about it and having a good time. Oh, and we see that there's also a drawing of Daphne up on Justin's section, and then another one of Jennifer and Molly. And then we see that Jennifer sees the drawing of Lindsay and Gus, and then the one of the naked man from behind, which she seems to be fine with. But then she sees the drawing of Brian. Debbie sees what she's looking at, and Debbie's looking kind of nervous. Brian goes up to Justin from behind. Who's that guy you drew? And you can't hear what they say after that, but there's this behind the scenes video where you can. Anyways, that's the exchange. So then Jennifer looks over and sees the two of them, and then Brian kisses Justin. I think he kisses him in real life too. I'm not sure if this is part of her imagination yet. I think that after that, that's where reality ends because then Jennifer starts to imagine the two of them and they're kind of looking at her very sinister-like and then they're having sex on slash next to the piano. And I just have to say, I, I mean, why did she go there? It seems a little weird and very graphic and descriptive for her to do. You know, I, you know, part of it is she's like, oh my god, he's sleeping with a full-grown man and I get that. But it's like, she's got quite the imagination. So then the kind of flash of her imagination ends. And then Jennifer leaves and Debbie follows her out. Back at Ted's apartment, Ted and Roger are going at it. Some opera is playing. You can also hear the sound of a ticking clock. So that motif, is it a motif? Or is it a symbol? I don't know, something um, from English class is going on behind them that we saw earlier with the watch. And then we also have Ted looking at his watch. So this is continued from the watch thing before. And then all of a sudden the ticking clock noise stops. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? No, I, I, I can't. So the clock has run out on the two of them. Their time is up. Also, as a little aside, Michael was counting the minutes of how long David spent on his nipples. But then, you know, here Ted is counting the minutes for a very different reason. You're just not my type. I thought you didn't want sex to be everything. Yeah, but I'd like it to be something. You're a cat. Any straight woman would find you incredibly attractive. Oh, is that supposed to make me feel better? Fuck you. This would be a totally appropriate relationship for me. The only problem is, is that sex isn't appropriate. You're not like all the others. You're worse. Because you think knowing Sesta's aria from Clemenza to Tito somehow makes you better? Well, let me tell you, you're nothing but a pretentious, self-involved, boring asshole who's still hanging around with younger guys who don't want you and never will. 
You're pathetic. Okay, so some harsh words from Roger, but I feel like there was some truth in there. Like, to be fair, Ted wasn't being at all nice to this guy, but I think that Roger took it a little bit too far. But he's also hurt and feeling unwanted and unattractive. So Ted thinks that he's better than all those, I don't know, pretty boy twinks, etc. because he's cultured, but it doesn't make him better than them. That part is true. I also wonder why Ted does hang around younger guys. I guess because that's the crowd he's interested in, but also maybe part of it is that he never really got to have that when he was in his 20s, that kind of lifestyle, and so he's doing that now? Maybe? I don't know. You might try going to a gym, you know? Get on a treadmill for once in your life, would you? And do something about your breath! Why does everybody keep acting like this guy is so fat? Like this and the Pillsbury Doughboy comment. I don't suppose we could still be friends. It's always so funny to me because earlier on in this episode when I was re-watching it, I was like, oh, I know it doesn't work out between the two of them, but it's too bad they don't end up as friends because they have so much in common. And then Ted said this and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's why. But basically, like, that comment from Ted is just the final nail in the coffin. Oh my god, when Ted sprays the air and then his mouth, oh my god, it's like the funniest thing ever. I die every time. Jennifer and Debbie are at a bar. I think it's Woody's. So Jennifer is upset because she thought Justin was with boys his own age, but then he's with someone who must be in his 30s. And she is totally justified in that. Like, way, way, way justified. Like, she should, she should be very upset about it. Well, it's not right. It happens. If his father finds out. <sighs> so this is the third mention of Justin's father. Uh, I am not excited to meet him, let me tell you. Tell me about him. This person. I have to know. Brian Kinney, God's gift, a gay PA. As he is, yes. They all want Brian, but the good news is no one can have him. He screws them, breaks their heart, and they wise up. Most of them, anyway. Okay, so obviously Justin didn't wise up, but I think she's mainly thinking about Michael here. I mean, Brian kind of screwed him kind of when they were kids, but he's also metaphorically screwed Michael many times, I'm sure, and his heart's probably been broken by him a ton too, but he never wises up, and Debbie sure wishes that he would. He's only 17. How old were you the first time? 16. 15. I've known Brian since he was 14. He hasn't changed much. In fact, I'd say he and Justin are pretty evenly matched. Which is something I think a lot of fans cling to um, in regards to their age difference. I mean, it's kind of true-ish, but you know, it's still problematic. I don't know if I can be so accepting. Funny. Jennifer, you don't have too much choice. All you can do is hope that they'll be careful and that they remember your phone number. Oh, Michael sure remembers her phone number. And she's also right, because if you're not accepting, then you're gonna lose him, possibly forever. And then Jennifer takes a wad of condoms. Ted is back at Babylon, and David is with all of them. Daphne and Justin are at Babylon too. Why does she stop going? Oh look, it's the cast of Zoom. No, 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 no. Justin sold some of his art today, so they're celebrating. And it's the drawing of Brian naked. Buy that. Probably some desperate queen who's always pined for you. Oh, Ted, how thoughtful. And it's, it's also doubly funny because I don't think that Ted has ever actually pined for Brian. I think that he definitely would love to be Brian, but I don't think he's ever pined for him. Michael and Brian start dancing to a remix of Dancing Queen. Michael apparently used to love that song. Who doesn't? Emmett can see that David is looking at Michael and Brian dancing. So then he takes David out onto the dance floor and starts dancing with him. He's such a good friend and kind person. Ugh, I love it. Brian gives Michael some drugs through a kiss. Anybody ever tell you you're a bad influence? Oh, he definitely is. Honestly, I think another part of this whole thing is that Brian thinks that settling down is like the worst thing and what's best for Mikey is this. Anyways, David sees this and he's not happy. And then we see Ted in the bathroom. Blake is back. Blake asks how he's doing. I never really knew for sure what happened that night. So I figured he came out of it okay. I kept looking in the papers. And the fact that he even was checking the papers, I think kind of shows that he did care for him a little bit. That he at least cared what happened to him. I mean, because lots of people wouldn't have done that. Waited on the corner. After I called the paramedics to make sure they came. He didn't want to stick around and get caught with the drugs. You took so much. I said, whoa. I'm glad you're okay. Maybe we could uh, get together again sometime without the paramedics. <laughs> okay, so I don't blame Blake at all for not sticking around. I get it. He didn't want to get arrested and I wouldn't want to get arrested either. I'm so glad that he called 911. I mean, if not only for the fact that 
Ted is alive. He saved Ted's life. Uh, he also put his life in jeopardy, but you know, whatever. You know, that and the fact that he waited to make sure the paramedics got there, that shows he's a, he's a pretty good person, right? I know it wasn't great what he did, but you know, whatever. But also Blake keeps looking back during his conversation with Ted. It's like he's making sure that someone doesn't come and then someone does come. It's taking you so long. He's talking to some guy. What's your name again? Ted. Ted, all right. See you later. Honestly, I get the vibes that this other guy was not a great guy. Like maybe he's someone that Blake deals for, owes money to, a pimp even. I don't know what this guy's situation is, but it doesn't seem like a good one. And it felt to me like Blake was kind of trying to protect Ted from that, or at the very least to even protect him from maybe this guy getting jealous and doing something to Ted. You could look at it like, oh, Blake's with someone else now and he doesn't even remember Ted's name, but it really depends on how you look at it. I think that coupled with the fact that he called 911, he waited on the corner and all of that, and the way he kept looking back and acting like he couldn't even remember what his name was, you know, I think he was just trying to protect Ted, like I said. But I don't know, you could see it the other way too. And then Ted walks up the stairs as he's leaving the bathroom and he keeps saying, hey, how are you to everybody? No one acknowledges him, except for one guy who just says, as if. As if. Oh, as if. And then he comes to Emmett at the top. I was rejected by everybody. It's good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> I love that moment. So, you know, it's great to be back. Not just going after someone appropriate, but also more importantly, being back to how things were before the overdose. He's finally back to normal and to the status quo and everything's how it was. So then David wants to take Michael home. Michael is obviously high. Brian watches them leave. He goes and starts dancing with someone else. We're back at Michael's apartment. He's kind of out of it. He's high. David kind of starts things with him and then asks, who are you thinking about? I guess he thinks that he'll get an honest answer out of Michael since he's high right now. But Michael just kisses him instead and David looks concerned. So did Brian get him high on purpose to mess up his and David's night? I don't know, possibly. Well, probably more than possibly, but. So then we're at the loft and Brian is with the guy from the comic book store and I still can't believe it. Did he see that guy at Babylon? And he was like, oh yeah, I know him. Or did he actually leave Babylon? and then call the comic book store guy. And then Brian takes off the guy's hat and puts it on his own head. And let me tell you, I would not put that thing on my head. That guy did not look like he has the cleanest hair. I guess it could be gel, but still, yeah, I would not be putting that on my head. No, 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 no. And then we see that while Brian is getting blown, he's looking at Justin's drawing of him. So he's the one who bought it. He paid $100 for it, which is money that goes to the GLC, even though we know that he hates the center. So that just, you know, goes to show how much he wanted it. Maybe he even wanted to make Justin happy by having him sell one of his pieces. So anyways, this whole thing of the end of this episode, Brian looking at the drawing that Justin drew of him while he's getting blown. I think it's like, partly ego. Part of it is Brian's ego, admiring himself and all that. But I think that he's also thinking about Justin. And I think he's kind of realized that Justin really does care for him. He's always kind of seen that, but then he sees this drawing and it's not just some obsessed, infatuated fan club thing. He drew Brian in a moment where he wasn't on for others. He's vulnerable, calm, sleeping, flaccid. He's just fully himself. He's not putting on this front or this persona that he usually does and that he thinks people are, he thinks that that's why people are so attracted to him. So to see him drawn in a moment where he's not putting that on and someone is attracted to him in that moment, I think it's kind of huge for him. He's never had that before or he's never realized that before. There's also kind of a shift in their relationship and Brian and Justin's, again, relationship after this point, kind of starting with 107. Brian starts to seem to care about him more and has him as more a part of the group instead of always just kind of annoyed that he's there. We kind of saw that also start to happen in this episode. The fact that he showed up at the art show mainly because Justin wanted him there. And again, that whole thing with the drawing, he kind of finally sees, oh, he feels about me like this when I'm not performing, when I'm not on. So he actually cares about me, which I don't think he thinks that there are many people who actually care about him or that there's really anybody who does. So yeah, the non-annoyance 
kind of thing starts in 106. He playfully hits him on the head. At Madeline Lindsay's, throws the teddy bear, tells Justin that his artwork is good, all of that. We kind of see that start to happen in 106, and then it's in 107 that a real change kind of has taken place. So like I said, I think some of it is his own ego, but I also think that some of it is Justin. Like he's never had someone really pursue him like that and really see him for who he is, for himself. We've really only seen Brian vulnerable around Lindsay maybe a little bit around Michael too, but he was doing that on purpose. So for someone to see him like that when he didn't mean to be, he also, like I said, wanted to make Justin happy. He knows that Justin cares. Him and Justin were acting pretty couple-y, cutesy at the art show, and that really wasn't a show that he was putting on for anyone. I mean, we know that Jennifer was watching and, you know, projecting all these dirty thoughts onto it, but it's also interesting how it's implied that while Michael is with David, he's thinking about Brian. And then in the next scene, we have Brian with someone and he's thinking about someone else, but he's seemingly thinking about Justin. Brian thinks that one of the only reasons that people like him is because he's got this whole like sex god persona thing. And that's the only reason that people want him. So he's not projecting that. And then Justin saw him in that moment and appreciated that and really saw him and drew it. So he's kind of realizing now, oh, this kid isn't just interested or like this kind of persona thing that I have that everyone is drawn to, he's actually drawn to me, even when I'm at my most vulnerable. When did you draw that? When you were asleep? So this is a really good episode. Like I said, I say that about every episode though. I love the Justin stuff. I love the Daphne stuff. The Brian and Justin stuff, obviously I love. Finally see Brian kind of go after Justin a little bit, which I mean, we kind of saw in 103. And I love in this episode, you really see Brian kind of appreciating Justin's feelings. And I don't know, yeah, kind of going after him a little bit. He showed up at the art show. He wrapped his arms around him at the show in public doing very cutesy couple of things. Not a Brian Kenny thing to do for sure. I love how Brian is kind of jealous. I mean, it's in a playful kind of way. Who's that guy you drew? Especially since in 103, we saw Brian realize that Justin could get other people if he wanted to, but it's only in this episode that Brian actually realizes that Justin not only can get other people, but that Justin also has had other people. I love the little Emmett moments we get in this episode. We see him be so supportive and caring and funny. I think that the Roger stuff is great. I kind of wish that we got to see a little bit more of him. Jennifer is just gold as always, except for that creepy little thing she was doing. But like I said before, the comic book store guy, not too sure about him. And we get to see more of David and his dynamic in the gang. Okay, so that was season one, episode six, The Art of Desperation. Next time is season one, episode seven, Smells Like Codependence. Do all the usual things, like, subscribe, comment, let me know your thoughts below. Bye!